just talk about nothing. Yeah, it's to warm up. Yeah. Yeah. What do you want to talk about? Because that's good. <laughs> yeah, all right. <laughs> Hi, I'm Hannah. Welcome to my channel. I'm Alex. I'm a second year PhD student. I'm studying nanoscience at the University of Nottingham. Um, my first question for you is when did you get into physics and why? Well, uh, it was no other option. Really? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> literally, yeah. Started out and then all the other things that I wanted to do, I wanted to do. From <laughs> like primary school age? No, no, no. So um, I was a. Uh, from primary school, I was always interested in sciences, yeah. and I really just enjoyed sort of all the little experiments they had you do when you were a kid. You know, you take a blot of ink and then you drop some water on it and just see all the colour and stuff like that. And then, yeah, you know, into secondary school and just all, I, I, I really stayed definitely interested in science. I like music as well, yeah. um, but then at some point I had to sort of make a decision whether I was going down one route or the other, and of course, um, there's no reason that you have to choose one uh, for the rest of your life. But uh, science was something I was good at, and science was something I wanted to continue. So I went to university and studied physics there. So did you know by the time you were choosing your A-levels that you were going to study physics? No. Uh, when I was in my A-levels, I was torn actually between, I did physics, maths, and further maths. So it's already looking like I'm going to do, <laughs> yeah, it's already looking like I'm going to do uh, physics. But uh, I also did music as well. And then, as an A-level? Yeah, as oh, an A-level. So I did AS music, yeah. and then when it came time to drop one, uh, music was the one. Um, creative differences, you know, but also I wasn't so much a performer, I was a composer. Mm -hmm. The module was so fixed in how it was that it was just like... It sort of took that passion Yeah, so it, yeah, the passion was taken away, but at that point I was really enjoying it. So I was doing more things like engineering schemes with the school libraries. Um, they had us uh, working with, I think it's National Group now, yep. to design a light holder for the back of a van. Was that sort of thing. <laughs> and we came here actually, we came to Nottingham University, made a circuit board and a sort of a metal frame that we put together. But it never quite finished that project, so I should go back to it. Um, but <laughs> uh, yeah, it was a, um, it was a uh, something that we did, and then it was definitely focusing more towards the science side of that one. Because I, I find that when you look at people's A-levels, if they've got a mix of like science and arts, it's heavily weighted in one and then there's one art subject, or it's heavily weighted in favour of arts and they might have maths. Yeah, maths is a common one for the sort of like the fourth A-level, isn't yeah. it? Like you see some people doing things like business studies and geography and, and uh, English yeah, and psychology, those sort of things, and there's maths in there as well. So I think that people do tend to, especially in early levels, Try and keep as sort of as broad as they can. Mm. Uh, I don't know what that's true, but yeah, 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 absolutely. I think by A two, you really do start focusing on, on the direction you want to go for university. So why not? If you're a local boy, there's no one escape. Well, have you seen the campus? Yet? Yes, it's, it's so lovely. amazing. <laughs> it's lovely. I mean, I think that when you're choosing a university, quite often, mm -hmm. and I gave this advice quite often in open days as well, is that when you're choosing a new university. Um, you instantly know. You just know the choice uh, as soon as you, um, as soon as you're there. You say you have that inkling. You say, ah, yeah. "This is where I want to study." Yeah. Um, so the open day for me here was the thing that really swung me. Uh -huh. uh, loved the campus. Loved the tour that I went on. Met some of the professors who are yeah. still professors now. Yeah. And uh, essentially, just yeah, Nottingham won it for me. So Nottingham was where I stayed. We spoke about it earlier a little bit, but what happened between finishing your undergrad and then going back to doing what? Well, a lot of people don't know what they want to do after they leave university, and some of them go straight into jobs. Um, and some, for some of those, that's a career for the rest of their lives. Quite a lot of people, but for some others, they realise this is not what I want to be doing. I'm transferring to a completely different field. Um, I've seen that with some friends. Some friends work for the. Uh, military uh, for the uh, Ministry of Defence and then they moved into uh, finance after that. Uh, yeah, so it's a complete change in the field, but um, for some people you, you, it's easy, it's almost easy, especially in sciences, that you make the decision, right, I've studied for four years, why not keep studying, because that's an option. Uh, but for me, it wasn't as straightforward as that, yep. so I went into work, I didn't do anything particularly career-y, I started working in a call centre actually, yeah, yeah, 
It was brutal, let's not go into that. And then I did some proofreading after that. I started doing some uh, testing of courses, uh, various e-learning courses yeah. after that. Related to science or just? No, related to all sorts of things. Uh, business law and things that they give to, to or all sorts of companies. You know, when you work for, uh, I can't really name them, but <laughs> I shouldn't really name them. I did something on the disclosure agreement. But, <laughs> but we won't mention that. If you go, yeah, yeah, if you go into a certain, um, company and then they'll give you a sort of trade that is just click through these great, uh, click through these information pages. Yeah. Some of them are arranged really fun and then you answer some questions at the end, like multiple choice questions and it's just about passing them. Uh, so that that was what we uh, did there. And then I went to work for Boots for a year and uh, decided that uh, just Boots as it's local. Yeah, what did you do at Boots? I uh, was on the help desk for pharmacies. They rang in I sorted of the IT problems for pharmacies wow. when they were bringing in the new electronic prescription service. It's mm -hmm. the ones where you can just send things directly rather than having to take a paper script. I think yeah, it's getting more common. The doctors are trying to run. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then uh, when travelling for a bit, uh, I lived in Berlin for a while, and then I came back and I decided actually academia as well. I want to do so. I came back and did, the did you have like a distinct light bulb moment where you? Just when this is it, this is what. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You had, had that light bulb moment because I was always saying, Well, I could do a PhD, yeah. this is what's option. I could do a PhD, I could do a PhD. And then I was in the pub, and a friend <laughs> of mine said, Why aren't you doing a PhD? And it was just that moment where, for the first time, the question really hit me, and it was like, Actually, that is what I want to do. So I'm going to see how I can go about sorting. But so you kind of had that inkling for most of your life, but it wasn't until sort of somebody put the pressure on. No, you. no, I, it was more than that. I was, I always said that I'm never going to rule out the idea of a PhD after my undergrad. I'd said that for years, and then someone said, "Well, why haven't you ruled it in?" Okay, so, <laughs> so why was it always a backup then? What did you think there was another career path? It wasn't a backup. There was never a backup. As, as I should be very clear on that. It was I decided that I didn't know what I wanted to do. Okay. And there were all these options of things that were available to me. Yeah. And I was in the soul searching stage, as so many are in their early 20s. Uh, yeah, it was a life crisis. Um, so many are in their early 20s. And then I decided that I just didn't want to do a lot of things. There were various sort of dreams um, that you have, sort of, oh, I could do this, I could, um, I want to see this place, so you go travel and yep. see that place. I want to work in this field, so you start researching that field. And then all of a sudden, it's the idea that actually active academia, which is different from an undergrad, it is different from the fact that you know you have this student lifestyle, that you actually want to go and do research and you want to do your bit in a university setting. That's what really, uh, that's what really struck it for me, and that's why I decided to do it. So it's almost like you were giving yourself space to make sure that, that was the right. Yeah, I think that's much more to the point, is that I didn't want to leap into academia because it was the obvious choice. I wanted yeah. to go into academia because it was the right choice. And do you think the experience that you gained in the interim has benefited you? Well, everyone is different. Um, uh, for some people, you could really, one could really resent that four year gap and say, why wasn't I doing anything there? And in fact, I heard a great story, which is someone who was around 27 um, uh, saying that they wanted to, uh, they weren't sure uh, whether they wanted to go and pursue a PhD because, you know, by the time they go uh, the three years through it, then they'll be 30 uh, and then they'll finish, you know, oh, I'm 30 and I've now got a, uh, and, and that's how long it's taken to get a PhD. And I heard a great response, which is, yeah, but you're 30 and you have a PhD. You know, in three years' time, three and a half years' time, you'll still be 30. <laughs> I mean, that, that is just the case. <laughs> you know, time doesn't stop. But no. you've made the decision to actually go down that route, which is the thing, that, uh, the, the point of it. So the, the, to answer your question, the four-year gap is, for me, was something that I'm really glad I did because it made the difference of coming in and knowing that I wanted to work here. If you imagine going in a really half-hearted sort of way of thinking, or for say the first year and a half you're doing a PhD and you're thinking, I don't know whether I want to be doing this. Yeah. That peace of mind 
is something that you know you can start and say this is what I want to do then yes. it yes. makes such a difference for how you start yeah that's interesting and I think that you're right the gap doesn't really matter no I mean look at me yes <laughs> I graduated when I was 23 and mm. when I graduate this time around and start a PhD I will be 33 mm. so it's good then. Uh, completely, but then you think about it and you, th you think this is almost a British thing because we really, uh, especially in the UK, we do love to get someone straight into university and then into a PhD and to, uh, to go through the system. Thanks, Tony Blair. <laughs> um, education, education, education. They literally mean school, university, PhD. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and very quickly close together. Um, <laughs> No, uh, and but the difference is, if you look at uh, a lot of places in Europe, people do PhDs in their thirties. That is, that's and undergraduate. Yeah, exactly. This is a yeah. common thing. Yeah. You know, we we are the exception here rather than the rule. And our PhDs are a lot shorter than many other. Yeah. PhDs. You, yeah. You absolutely. You know, we are set to three and a half years usually as the standard. This isn't always the case, but it's three and a half years as a rule here. Um, and in Europe. You've got all sorts of, uh, of people doing this for five or six years or, or even longer and it's just a case of, of doing because it is a job it's a study and it's a project mm -hmm. that you do so it's not just a case of, of um, uh, running through the system which is i think what we're in danger of here so there really needs to be no label on how long these things take do you find that some people just sort of drift into PhDs because it's the next step oh it's or it's it going to be the case for us some people they want to go into academia because it's the world they know and the odds, uh, the options are, you know, continue in this nice little field that I, I, I found that I quite like or be thrown out onto the street and, and you know, <laughs> you, say to, you say to the university, uh, um, help, <laughs> and I say, well, you graduated. <laughs> I know that's not quite the case, but, but obviously there is a certain safety net feeling sometimes about PhD and I never never say that anyone that I, I, I know feels like they are doing a PhD because it was the obvious choice um, or it's the choice that they, they want to, um, that, that it was a safety net thing. But it has to be the case for some people, you know, some people are going to go in and generally, you know, you do find whether you want to stay there or not within a few weeks, a few months, so you know. It's not okay. It's like with any job, you find the suitability That's true. with yourself. You may as well try it in some instances. It's yeah. Like it's yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously, when you make a commitment like uh, doing a PhD to a certain extent, you do feel that you are wanting to, you, you need to be a little bit surer, I would say. But, um, but at the same time, yeah, it, it, it is something where people find their feet and whether it works for them or not. But I don't. Don't need to, to stay by any means that people are going for a year and a half and, and deciding, oh, I'm not sure if this is for me. Is it? I don't think that's going to be the case. <laughs> and what do you see yourself going into? Do you want to be a professor? I would dearly love to stay in academia. I really would. Uh, there are obviously issues that, uh, you know, the next level up is always smaller than the level you're on, so not every PhD student is going to get to stay in academia. It's something that I would try to do. It's something that I really want to put in the effort for. I'd love to stay in science in some manner. That's what I think I've decided. Uh, particularly sort of an education side of science. If I could work in science outreach, for example, that is something that I really want to do. I'm it's smiling science. because it, it's definitely... A, I'm concerned about the fact that the further you go, the smaller it, the, it gets. But I would love to be involved in science communication. Yeah, exactly. It's just something that you really want to it's really captured people's minds and I've seen enough, um, I've heard enough gasps and I've heard enough uh, wows and seen enough smiles to, just to know that it's so worth doing it. What's been the most difficult aspect in terms of studying physics, whether that was back in the undergrad or now? It's a bit of a... The most difficult aspect? Yeah, in terms of the material, is there any sort of area, basically, were there any hiccups along the way, any aspects that with studying physics that you struggled with? Because from my point of view, a lot of people see physics as a very difficult subject. And they might, from the outside, might assume that most people go into physics because they're just naturally good at it mm. and don't have to particularly work very hard. Uh, 
there are, I think, for a lot of people, hurdles. Um, there are changes in mindset. For example, if you're in school and someone says to, and this is in A level, and someone says to you, "This is how this works." Um, that, for example, one thing that I was taught in school is that there are ten classifications. You, you, there's energy. Energy is this thing, and you can have light energy, sound, heat, uh, electric, magnetic, kinetic, potential, uh, chemical. I think there's another potential because <laughs> you've got elastic and gravitational oh God, potential, yeah. and then there's one more which, for the moment, is completely evading me. Uh, nope. did, if I didn't say heat, then it's that one. If I yep. did say that, then it's something that I've, I've completely forgotten about. Yeah. Yeah. Something like that. Um, but then you realise that no, that's an arbitrary classification you've made in school. What it actually is is that everything is a manifestation of either a motion, a movement or potential to move. Mm -hmm. um, so everything boils down to sort of kinetic or potential okay. in some some respect. Mm -hmm. um, so those equations are helpful just all the Well you do have to realise that physics is maths and that the way you read physics is to read maths. Yeah. And sometimes to be told this happens in this way because this, this, this. It, I mean you don't you would hear in school, imagine that the universe is like a big tarpaulin, and when you yeah. drop a uh, drop a uh, um, weight on that, then that bends the tarpaulin like it bends space time. Yeah. That's all good. That's all well and good, but you do want that in a mathematical sense. You just want a sort of idea of 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 how things bend in terms of you know equations. And I don't seek seek to be. I'm not a cosmologist, and, and these are things that I don't remember from undergrad. But it's you know. just a lot. Well, I've only done the equivalent of A level now, but it seems like it's just a lot easier to talk in language. You can say a lot more. Yeah. Using fewer words. Fewer yeah. Words. I mean, one of the classics is Maxwell's equations. Uh, Maxwell's equations. I don't know whether you've come across them yet. yet. Okay. There are four um, four equations that basically summarise all of all of electromagnetism, as it were, and they're they're the key ones. Um, and they're so beautiful, so simple. There's four of them that are just line by line, and I can usually just about remember them. But to put them into words makes no sense, or it it it, it, it it's not the whole story. Yeah. I mean, for example, okay, for example, um, the second law basically says there are no. I don't know about second. I mean, you can order these whatever way you want. But basically, yeah, one of the laws says that there's no magnetic monopoles. So when you have a magnet, you have a north and a south. You can never have just a north because the magnetic field goes to the south. All well and good, and that's fine to put it that way. Um, but at the same time, Maxwell puts in his equation, which is about five symbols long, that the divergence of the magnetic field is always equal to zero. I don't know what that means. So if you take any magnetic field that uh, yeah. that basically it doesn't diverge, it goes from to somewhere, and yeah. you know you've got the super north and south pole which are the part. Yeah. Um, and uh, essentially, the, the the summary is that there are no magnetic monopoles. That basically, uh, if you look over a whole picture, that they you know there there is always a north and a south. But you can do so much more with the maths. There. I mean, not only is it put in a more con concise way, but then you can use that equation to make another, uh, to, to fit in, to substitute into another equation you have, and then you can start working, you can make more, um, more sort of uh, ideas. If you sub all of Maxwell's four equations into each other, you get a wave equation, and that wave equation is the representation of light, it's the representation of a photon an electric field and magnetic field that are propagating perpendicular to each other. I'm excited to get to that point. Yeah, it and so it's, far so, off. <laughs> it's so beautiful if you look at them, if you just say these are the four equations and are by themselves, they represent how electricity and electric yeah. fields work and magnetic fields work. You sub them all into each other, you can see how light works essentially yeah. now, by the fact that you can combine them all with a bit of mathematical sort of jiggery pokery, you know, knowing, 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 your, <laughs> knowing your identities and stuff, you yeah. can suddenly see this this really glorious thing, which you couldn't say if you just made four statements, four, four statements about uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, um, about, uh, the um, 
about electromagnetism in their in their points. You couldn't form yeah. words into a new idea, which you can with maths. And it is it is great. And uh, something I had to reconcile with that fact that I had to study maths to be able to understand physics. Mm. Everyone says, and I've never hated maths, but I think I was partly at school anyway, partly annoyed that I would have to do maths to, to do physics. I just wanted to read books about it. And yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. But if you did A level maths or further maths, was that ever an issue for you, or do you, think, do you think that's just a common issue for students coming into physics and they still don't realise? <laughs> <laughs> um, I was pretty prepared for the fact that physics would be mathematical. Yeah. I think I once heard someone say. People who are in chemistry are surprised, who go into chemistry are surprised just how much physics is in chemistry as a degree. Yeah. And people who go into physics are surprised just how much maths is in it. And I, I was always prepared for the fact that there would be a lot of maths there. But there are things, even on any scale, someone's going to find a point, unless you're very, very clever and very, very talented, someone's going to find a point where, ah, uh, okay, these, this mathematics is getting a bit beyond me. Um, for me, it was trying to work with Bessel functions. So Bessel functions, the idea that you have a, we just talked about waves. Yep. So it's the whole idea that you have a wave equation and you have a, uh, let's say, a string or a pipe and you, you can create a one, a one dimensional wave that goes down that. And the whole point about that is that there are, there has to be a complete cycle of Waves. You have to end with a note, start with a note, okay. as it were. There it has to be, or at least there has to be. If you combine, if you're taking a standing wave, yeah. which you do on a string, because you can find both ends, then you have a definite integer number of wavelengths yeah. along the string. But if you combine, confine in an area, as you do in a drum, mm -hmm. you're now confining in two dimensions, right. which means that you don't have an integer number of of uh, wavelengths, yeah. you have a, an integer square rooted number of wavelengths, which is when you have an integer number of wavelengths yeah. and you add all those together, musically those tones work with each other, right. they, they sound natural together, that's how they occur. When you hit a surface that is, is 2D, they don't work nearly as well, which is why percussive things yeah sound percussive because they're in two dimensions rather than one dimension. That's where you're reading. Yes, yeah, that's where, <laughs> that's where the music aside to a certain extent comes in. But that's the point, is, is instruments that, have, that are melodic yeah. work by confining a wave in one dimension. Even, you know, trom trombone goes all the way along that violin string and flutes, it's all, it's all a pipe or, or a string that is confined in one direct dimension. Anything that's percussive confines in two dimensions. What's your favourite and your least favourite aspect of your PhD? There is a slight franticness. I'm going to go for the least least favourite first. There's a slight franticness hmm. um, to uh, the fact that you don't necessarily know what you're going to be doing in a week's time or a month's time. You do know that these certain appointments exist, for example. Yeah. You know you've got a conference in three weeks, for example. You've got a deadline for the conference. No idea. Okay, good. <laughs> no. But a few weeks ago I had a conference in three weeks and then a few weeks later I had a conference. So, uh, that's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so you know that you've got these appointments, you've got a conference in three weeks, you've got uh, a deadline here, yeah. you've yeah. got a set amount of time on, and there's there's a level of sort of, they're, they're all fixed, but at the same time there's a lot of uncertainty about it, A, what you've got as material, your knowledge, um, who you need to get in contact with, and, and you know, you juggle the fixed with the unknown and the in unknown terms of working working days. Is that all down to you as well to figure of out? Of course, yeah, yeah, it, yeah, completely. So you have to decide how to manage your time, as anyone does in any job ever. I mean, the fact that, that people say, oh, a PhD is all about time management, well, what job is it? <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, it's, it's, hardly, it's hardly the most profound statement that yeah. I've ever heard. <laughs> But uh, there is a, there's a certain level of known and unknown that you have to combine together. Yeah, that, that makes sense. That, that uh, I think to me, uh, to me slightly. I mean, I guess, I guess you could argue that what I dislike is, is actually very fundamental to any job in some capacity. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a sort of, would you ever be happy sort of idea. Yeah, but maybe amplified. Maybe. Uh, it's certainly 
interesting how you really do. Yeah, there's a, there's a sense that you don't quite know when you've gone off the rails. Like, <laughs> I don't mean like you've gone mad and you're doing something completely wrong, but there, there, there's a delay to finding out where you need to get it back on track that okay. perhaps doesn't exist in a different environment. Because, of course, you are responsible for it all yourself. Yeah. Daunting. Yeah, it, it can be daunting, but, you know, it's suffering. You, you don't tighten your belt and you get on with it. Um, but, yeah, and as for favourite, well, I mean, the whole thing is great. The fact is that you're trying to research something that you have passion about. You're trying to bring that to other people. You're trying to learn more about it. And you're just given the option and the tools to do so. So this is great. And, and you, you know, I do find it a little difficult to, to be able to summarise what I, I, I've got to get the blood knowing. And I guess it's a sort of mild paranoia where you say, I'm pushing this right. And that's sort, of, that's sort of not relevant to it nearly as much as getting it down and then we learn together how to put things correct. Yes. But uh, there is a sort of side where you it's just lovely to be able to be working on something that is so interesting. So, you know, I'm lucky. I, I get to do this. Now.